All right, so we're going to talk about surgery and IBD, and then a specific complication of pouch surgery and ulcerative colitis called pouchitis. So basically, I think you know that this is meant for education. Any decisions you make about your care should be between you and your doctors. And that's me. I'm a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. I run the division of gastroenterology there. I uh, do a, a bit of research. Most of my research is related to C. difficile infection and less for IBD. Um, okay, so I assume you're here because you have specific questions about surgery. So I, I really do want this to be interactive. So we've got slides to kind of frame the discussion, maybe show you some pictures, but at any point, raise your hand. We can stop and talk about whatever you want to talk about, okay? So the, the most important thing that I want to say is that surgery is part of the treatment of IBD. We wish to avoid it. We work hard to avoid it. We've got many more medicines that are really effective to help us reduce the risk of surgery, but sometimes surgery is the right thing to do. So the key is to understand when it's the right thing to do and what is the surgery to do. So why would we do surgery in somebody? One of the more common ones is just the disease doesn't respond to the medications. Okay, so just refractory disease, and sometimes you just need to remove it to get the patient feeling better. Sometimes a person has a really severe flare. Sometimes even when they present, it's just so severe that we don't have time to wait for the medicines to work. We, they're really sick, we need to get them to the operating room. And then finally, complications. So the more common complications would be, as we heard in the, this morning's talk, was everyone at the morning talks? Because some of the stuff is gonna be redundant. The inflammation causes scarring, Scarring can cause blockage, and that causes obstruction. Perforation, when there's a hole in the bowel, that's an emergency. A less emergent penetrating complication is called fistulas. That's when there's a hole from the bowel to the skin or another organ. And then finally, chronic inflammation can lead to cancer or something called dysplasia, which is a precancerous change that's really important though. So any of those would be reasons to do surgery. We're going to break this down by Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, although you'll see a lot of the concepts are really the same between the two. So this is a picture of an inflamed bowel. I should probably put a normal bowel up here, but this is quite abnormal. So the bowel should look like the inner lining of your cheek, smooth, um, a healthy appearing, tannish. This is red, which is more blood flow. That's inflammation. And then all the suppressed areas, these little depressed areas are all ulcers. So that bowel is completely ulcerated, and you can imagine the pain and diarrhea that would cause. And then the stricture is the word we use for narrowing. This is a patient that had surgery, and they put the bowel back together, and where they do the connection is called anastomosis, and that's a common area where um, stricturing could occur. And you can see how tight that is. The, 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 the center of the bowel is here, so we couldn't even get a scope through there and, and imagine stool's gonna have a hard time coming through there too. So that's a stricture. And if we can't get that better with medicines, that oftentimes needs surgery to get rid of the narrowed part. And on a CT scan, this is what it would look like. So this is colon and this is the small bowel. And this is a connection between them that should be more open. That's very narrowed. And the white is what inflammation looks like on a CAT scan. So that's an inflamed narrow segment and importantly, what's happening is as the stool is trying to come down through here, it's getting blocked. It's causing that bowel to swell up. That's called uh, dilatation. I think it's on there somewhere. So that's, that's showing us that not only is the blockage there, but it's impairing the flow of stool. Again, that's going to cause pain and nausea and not feel like eating, maybe weight loss. So that is obstruction. And, and the, the tag team this morning showed a similar um, graph to this, but the point is that at diagnosis, this is for Crohn's disease, most patients have inflammatory Crohn's disease. So that, that sort of inflamed tissue, pain, diarrhea, but generally amenable to medical therapy. A few percent have strictures or the narrowing from scar tissue and about 12, 15% will have penetrating disease like fistulas right at the time of diagnosis. And over time, you can see the shift where inflammatory becomes less common and the complicated part, with, which is strictures or fistulas, become more common. And it's those complications that require surgery more often, okay? The good news is this data all comes from older studies, right? Because this is 20 years worth of data, so these are patients that were taken care of, you know, 30, 40 years ago. With the newer medications that we just heard about, 
it's changing the history of Crohn's disease. So we're getting less of these complications and we're actually seeing now less need to go to surgery. So there really is, is good news here. But the, the disease progresses over time. And because of that, this shows the rate of surgery over time. So again, at presentation, which is D for diagnosis, about 30% of patients need surgery right at the time of diagnosis because they present with a complication. And then over time, because of the accumulation of complications, the risk of surgery goes up and up and up. And then finally, this is a study that looked at all the reports of the need for surgery, put them together, try to come up with averages. And you can see at one year, 16% of patients needed surgery. At five years, a third of patients need surgery. At 10 years, almost half. And then they said, well, you know, we've got newer medicines, so are we making a difference? And you can see that's patients diagnosed, diagnosed after 1990, especially at five and 10 years, the risk of surgery is going down. So we are making a difference with these medications. So when you look at that last talk with the red and green and yellow stop signs, why would we use drugs that are red? Why would we use drugs that cause cancer or serious infection? It's because the risk of those things is low and it's helping us avoid things like surgery, which is really important, okay? So it's balancing that benefit and risk. All right, so for Crohn's disease, there's several kinds of surgeries, and we'll just show pictures. So schematically, right, are you, you should all be familiar with your anatomy now. The colon or large intestine goes around the outside of the bowel, or outside of the abdominal cavity, then the small bowel fills in the middle. And where they come together, it's called the ileocecal connection. And that ends up being where Crohn's is most likely to be active. So when you have surgery, that's one of the really common places for surgery. The diseased area is highlighted in red, so the surgeon would take out the diseased area and then take the small bowel and sew it back to the um, colon. Sometimes you have a narrowing, depicted by that pinch up there, that you don't want to cut out. That's usually because either the patient has lots of strictures and you have to take out a lot of bowel, or they've already had a surgery, you don't want to keep taking out pieces of bowel. So they, they can do this really cool thing called stricturoplasty, where they can make a cut along the length of the bowel and then pull it open and then sew it closed that way. So that relieves the obstruction without taking any bowel. So it's a really cool way to fix the blockage without removing a piece of intestine so you can still absorb nutrients at that, that part. Other options, sometimes you just remove the colon and bring the ileum out to the skin. That's called an ileostomy. If it's the conventional ileostomy, also called brook ileostomy, then you would put a, a bag on the outside of the skin to collect the stool and then empty the bag in the toilet. Sometimes you do an operation called a coke pouch or a continent ileostomy. That's not done very commonly, but a few centers, including uh, down at Mayo, we, we have some surgeons that do this. And the idea there is you make a pouch on the inside just before the stoma so that as a stool comes in, it kind of puts pressure on the pouch and that closes off the valve. So you don't need to wear a bag. And then when you're ready to empty it, you put a catheter in and drain it into the toilet. So it's an option for certain patients where you don't have to wear a bag on the outside. And then finally, if the rectum is not too inflamed, which is often the case in Crohn's disease, you can leave that in place and then attach the small bowel to the rectum. And that has lots of benefits because um, Operating in the pelvis, imagine how tight that would be for the surgeon. If you can avoid that, you can avoid some pretty significant complications. So anyway, lots of options for Crohn's disease. And then sometimes a Crohn's involves the skin around the anus. And we call that perianal Crohn's disease. And I have some pictures to show you about that, but you may find it upsetting. So if you don't like gross pictures, you can look away and just be a minute. But this is called perianal Crohn's disease. And, and what we find, this is a bad case, right? This is quite advanced. Usually there's one hole. This person has 10 or 12 holes. So the idea is the inflammation got outside the bowel and it's finding its way somewhere, in this case happens to be to the skin. And as it's finding its way to the skin, the bacteria in the tract can fester and turn into an uh, abscess or a collected um, infection. So what the surgeon did here is clean out the tract so that you get rid of the sort of dead infected tissue and now you, the pink stuff is the healthy tissue. Then they put these loops in called the seton. The idea, it may seem counterintuitive. Why would you want to keep a tract open? The reason is that you keep it open so if there's any bacteria, they come out instead of festering while we're using medicines to make it better. And, and in this case, I, I like this one because this patient had a really good outcome. 
So with aggressive medical therapy, they got better and they were able to remove all those cetons and now there's no fistulas. Um, in full disclosure, this is an extreme example of a good outcome. Many patients with that bad of a perianal disease don't have such a good outcome. And that's what, what this slide shows. So these are patients that had the ileostomy not to remove the colon, but to make the stool go into a bag so it's not going through the sick part of the bowel. And actually, that works pretty well. Um, so you see here on the left, two-thirds of patients got better by making the stool not go through the sick part of the bowel. So pretty effective. But only half of those wanted to have the stoma closed. So they felt so much better with the bag, they said, I don't want to go back. I want to just keep it the way it is. I feel pretty good. Of those that attempted to close the stoma, only half of those actually were successful. So the problem is when you close the stoma, the stool's going through the sick area, it gets sick again. So if you're thinking about what's called a diverting ileostomy to get the stool away from the bowel, just realize a lot of times it's not temporary. It ends up being permanent, either because you want it to be or because the disease uh, comes back as soon as you close the stoma. And then again, to make the point, not to be too depressing here, but when you have perianal disease, sometimes we have to remove the rectum. That's the only thing that works, and that's called a proctectomy. Now, unfortunately, despite all that, surgery doesn't cure Crohn's disease. I think you probably know that. So even if we cut out all the inflamed tissue, it still likes to come back. So just to make the point here that the top blue line is the, the risk of needing recurrent surgery after you've had one surgery. You can see over time it becomes more common. In the middle, the, uh, the dark blue and then the circles are symptoms or laboratory recurrence, meaning patients start to feel symptoms or the, get anemic or the protein levels drop or something like that. And, and that's about you know 30% right off the first year, and then that accumulates over time, it being more common. And then at the bottom in the black is the most sensitive way to see if Crohn's is coming back. And that's putting a scope in there and looking at it. That's called endoscopic recurrence. And that's common. So in this study, it was over 70% risk of recurrence in the first year. Okay? And we'll talk about why that's important. So 70-ish percent will have an endoscopic recurrence. That means 30% don't. So can we predict who's likely to have a recurrence versus who's not likely to have a recurrence? And here's some of the factors. You heard some of this this morning. The younger the onset of the disease, the more the risk of it coming back after surgery. Having surgery shorter, uh, quickly after the diagnosis also predicts a more aggressive type, more likely to come back. Men, for whatever reason, more likely than women. The more surgeries you've had, the more likely it is to come back etc. And then uh, just to, to make the point, smoking, so if hopefully none of you are smokers, but smoking's bad for lots of reasons, including Crohn's disease. So the risk of recurrent surgery, you can see here, in non-smokers compared to smokers, it's about twice as high if people continue to smoke after surgery. So one of them, it's probably the only modifiable risk factor, meaning the one we can change. So if you're smoking, you should stop. So that brings us to the point of medical management after surgery, even if all the active disease has been cut out, can we use medicines to make it less likely for the Crohn's to come back? So that's called post-operative management. This comes from uh, Dr. Miguel Ruggiero from uh, Cleveland, who's done a lot of research in this area. So if the patient's low risk, they don't have any of those risk factors we just talked about, then we just let them recover from surgery. We do a scope six months later and we look at that area where they put them back together and see if there's any inflammation. And I'll show you pictures of this. If there's little or no inflammation, that's called a Rutgers zero or one, that's good. That predicts the patient's gonna do okay. We would then repeat the scope a year or two later and make sure it's staying healed. As opposed to whether they're starting to show sores on the inside, so it's recurring endoscopically, even if they don't feel any symptoms, that's a really high predictor of things going bad. So then we would start treatment, typically with an anti-TNF, which you heard about this morning. And by the way, if I use terms like anti-TNF, if you're not sure what that is, please just raise your hand and I'll explain it. So that's stratifying the treatment based on what we see with the scope, even if the patient feels perfectly well. As opposed to patients who have lots of those risk factors, that's a high risk for it coming back. Then we would start right off the bat with a TNF after surgery. Um, and if they can't do that either because of cost or they don't want to, then there's another option using those immunomodulatory medications that you heard about plus an antibiotic. 
And if they're in the middle, maybe you use that, that intermediate step. But the point is when you start therapy, you're still going to look six months later. Even if they feel great, you're going to look and see if you're making a difference with the inflammation. Because it's the inflammation that drives the complications, not whether the patient feels it or not. So this score, when we look inside, is probably the strongest predictor of what's going to happen to the patient after surgery. And w without belaboring the point, you can see for one, two, or three years later, the more severe the endoscopic appearance, the more likely you are to have a symptomatic flare. And so I0 means there's no inflammation. It looks completely normal. I1 is at the top, just a couple of these little sores called erosions, little baby ulcers, less than five. And then two, three, four is more severe inflammation. So again, we, we um, call zero and one endoscopic remission, and two, three, four is endoscopic recurrence. Even if there's no symptoms, we would want to jump on that especially if you have the three or the four. The more severe inflammation is what predicts the need for another surgery. All right. So just to summarize a bunch of data, th this study looked at different kinds of treatments to prevent post-op recurrence compared to placebo. And if you're on the left side of the line, that means the drug is better than placebo. You can see all these drugs were better than placebo. The farther away you are from the line, the better it is. And you can see at the top is the anti-TNFs, like Remicade or Humira, okay? And that's for clinical recurrence. The bottom's for endoscopic recurrence. Same picture. TNFs are the best drug to prevent Crohn's from coming back after surgery. So to summarize, Crohn's uh, surgery is required in some patients. It's the right thing to do in some patients. We try with medicines to avoid it, but sometimes we can't avoid it. We talked about the risk factors. Newer medications and modern management, like looking, even if the patient feels well, really is changing the natural history of the disease with less complications. And then if, if a patient has the perianal form of the disease, that's a very aggressive form, and we have to be aggressive with our treatments to try to get it under control. So let, let me stop there. Any questions about Crohn's disease surgeries or post-operative management? There are, yeah. So for a 25-minute talk, I had to be judicious with which studies I picked. Um, there, there's a fair bit of work recently on anti-TNFs preventing post-op recurrence. And now these newer drugs you heard about, like Stelaria, like Ativio, some of these small molecule drugs, no doubt those are going to enter studies to look at post-op recurrence. Okay? So that more data is coming. Other questions about Crohn's disease? All right, so we'll talk about ulcerative colitis. So same kind of options. So if we have to remove the rectum and the colon, you can bring the small bowel out to the skin called a uh, brook ileostomy, or you can make that internal pouch called a coke pouch, or you can do that ileorectal anastomosis. This in ulcerative colitis ends up being an option we think about for young women who still want to have families. Because if you do pelvic operation like this pouch in the middle I'm going to talk about, the scar tissue from that surgery can really increase the risk of infertility. So sometimes in a young woman, if the rectal disease is not too bad, we'll try to do an ileorectostomy to preserve fertility. Having said all that, the, the preferred surgery, if, if appropriate, is this ileopouch anal anastomosis in the middle. So basically what happens there is uh, the colon and the rectum get removed. The surgeon then takes the end of the small bowel called the ileum, folds it back on itself, and makes a pouch. So there's some reservoir or some capacity for the stool to sit without running to the toilet. And then attach the pouch down to the anus. And while that's healing, they do an ileostomy so the stool comes out while that heals. And then typically three months later, they come back and close the stoma so now the patient can go to the bathroom on the toilet. That's called an ileal pouch anal anastomosis, or IPAA. So whether it's for UC or for Crohn's disease, we're, if we're looking at medical therapy versus surgery, there's trade-offs for both. There's no right answer. Medical therapy, there's always a risk of non-response. So even our best therapies have a good third, uh, third, a third of patients don't respond to treatment. Some of these drugs are immunosuppressive, so there's risk of things like infection or cancer. Um, and then other toxicities based on the specific drug. The other thing with medical therapies, most of these don't work really quickly. So if we're going to try a medicine, we're going to wait weeks or sometimes months to see if it works, and can we afford that, that delay? 
versus surgery, a quicker fix, but there's surgical risk. Things like bleeding, infection, uh, other surgical complications. We mentioned fertility, if we're getting into the pelvis with surgery. And then pouchitis, which is the most common complication after a pouch surgery, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about. Before I get to that, any questions about surgery for ulcerative colitis? Okay, so pouchitis. Pouchitis basically means that pouch that the surgeon put down in the pelvis gets inflamed. That's what the, the name means, and it's a little confusing if you read the literature about it because there's different ways to categorize it. Acute versus chronic, it's an infrequent or frequently relapsing or just continuously active. Uh, particularly important is the response to antibiotics. So does it respond to antibiotics? Is it dependent on antibiotics? It means that it responds, but as soon as you stop, it comes back, so they need to stay on antibiotics. Or is it antibiotic refractory? This doesn't respond and we need to use something else. And these terms can be put together. So it can be a little bit confusing, but if you think about the terms, it makes a lot of sense. So for example, acute antibiotic responsive pouchitis versus something like chronic antibiotic refractory pouchitis and different permutations really helps us explain to the patients what to expect and also know, importantly, how to treat it. So this is what pouchitis looks like. The top, a little bit more severe case, the bottom a little bit milder. Um, but about a third of patients with ulcerative colitis need colectomy. With the modern treatments, that looks like it's going down a little bit, down to maybe about 20% risk. And hopefully with the newer drugs, it's going to get even lower, and someday we'll be able to treat colitis without needing surgery. But a good proportion need surgery. Of those that get a pouch, about half are going to get inflammation. So when we're counseling a patient, we need to be careful we don't mislead them and think you're going to be cured. We don't like to use the word cured when we take out the colon. You're curing colitis, you might get pouchitis back. And from a patient's perspective, cramps, diarrhea, et cetera, that kind of feels the same. So we're not surprised when a person gets pouchitis. The good news, as I'll talk about in a minute, is it's usually pretty easy to treat. But those that get it tend to get it back again, so you get recurrence. The question is how frequently does it come back or how quickly does it come back? And then only about 5 or 10% have that chronic inflammation, okay? So treatment for acute pouchitis, pretty good option. So a drug called Cipro, a common antibiotic, not a lot of risk of side effects, uh, works in 95% of patients. Another drug called metronidazole has more side effects and then lots of other antibiotics we can use. Typically, we give it for two weeks. We see if they're responsive. Then we stop and see if it comes back and if it comes back, how quickly. And that dictates what we do next. So if there's three or fewer episodes a year, we treat episodically. In other words, when the patient's having symptoms, we give two weeks of antibiotics. If it comes back quickly, within a few weeks of stopping, or they've had three or four episodes per year, then we say, maybe you're better off just staying on antibiotics and preventing the recurrence in the first place. And then if you have chronic pouchitis, again, the, that's broken down to antibiotic dependent versus refractory or resistant. If it's dependent, that's easy. The name tells us what to do. It says the patient feels well when they're on antibiotics, so just keep them on antibiotics. If you're going to stay on antibiotics long term, there's a risk that that antibiotic will select resistant organisms. The, drug, the bugs get resistant to the drug. So then we would use typically something called cycling antibiotics. We pick three or four different ones, week or two on one drug, stop, week or two on another drug that works differently, and then another one. And by using different kinds of antibiotics, you're much less likely to pick out resistant bacteria. Okay? And then probiotics. Anyone here heard of probiotics? Yeah, everyone's heard of probiotics, right? It's the miracle drug, the cure for everything, right? So there were a couple studies looking at probiotics and pouchitis that looked incredibly promising. So this anti uh, probiotic called VSL number three, in this study, only 15% of patients on VSL had a flare of pouchitis versus everyone on placebo. And another study from the same group showing basically the same things, like incredibly effective for preventing recurrence of pouchitis. Those studies were done in Europe. Some of the investigators on the study actually worked for the company that makes the drug. I don't know if that's important or not. But for whatever reason, in the US, we don't seem to be able to reproduce those results. So at Mayo, we've not published our results, but we just don't find it's very effective. And this is a study from Cleveland uh, looking at their experience. The bottom line is that after just nine months, 
80% of patients were off VSL because it wasn't working. So for whatever reason, we haven't been able to find the same benefit from this drug as was reported in the study. So Eugenia, I don't know about you guys, we tend not to use a lot of VSL in our practice. Yeah. Not a panacea. Now, 20% were doing okay at nine months. And we do have patients that come in and say, I'm on VSL and I feel better on it. And when I stop it, I feel worse. So, okay. You've defined yourself as one of those patients that benefits. So go ahead and stay on it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So to summarize, um, surgery is needed in 20 to 30 percent of patients with ulcerative colitis. That risk is going down with better treatments, so good news. Most patients who need surgery for ulcerative colitis will opt for that ileal pouch, anal anastomosis. Pouchitis is a common complication, but usually pretty easy to manage with antibiotics. And I think that's my last slide, and I think we're probably right about at time, aren't we? So let me just see if you have any quick questions.